thanks to Peter and everyone uh, for putting this together. I'm like super excited to be here, so like a round of applause for him. This is a really fun, uh, yeah. So um, I'm an editor at Newsweek and I'm a writer and for a while I was doing freelance writing, uh, mostly comedy um, for places like uh, the New Yorker and Fusion and Gawker and rest in peace Gawker um, and everyone else. Uh, I will say the extent of my <clears throat> public speaking experience is stand-up comedy, so uh, I'm not used to speaking in the morning to sober people. <laughs> uh, so bear with me. Um, cool. Um, yeah, so also I knew a lot of people would be here, so I thought it would be pretty cool to monetize my talk. Um, I just, I, I contacted a few local corporations and allowed them to just sponsor a few slides throughout. Um, just don't worry about it, the, the offers will be relevant to you and your lifestyles. Um, so let's start with the first sponsored slide. Uh, Soylent, you'll eat liquid out of a tube when you're old, why not start today? Um, so one of the reasons I'm drawn to satire is I believe it's an incredibly um, persuasive tool that can affect social change. Uh, it's like a crowbar for social change. Um, generally, people would be more willing to uh, you know, read or interact with something that's funny rather than a 20,000 word medium piece about why socialism is good. And they'd be much more, uh, it's harder for them to argue with you if you're laughing. Um, that said, if that only happens if they see what you're doing, um, if they read it. So um, one of the kind of distressing things that's happening now with the sort of centralization of the web under corporate control. <clears throat> uh, again, morning, sober. Uh, one of the distressing things about this sort of like centralization of the web is that it makes it really hard to get people to see what you're doing. Um, I probably don't need to go into like a detailed definition of the filter bubble, but generally like people will see stuff that relates to what they want to see and this kind of creates an environment where they're not, their viewpoints aren't challenged and they just see more of the same. And th this makes it hard to create effective satire because um, the right people aren't going to see it. You tend to, um, I don't know, you, you offer maybe relief to people rather than uh, persuading like different people. Um, so thinking about this kind of um, problem made me start to experiment with differing forms um, outside of like my typical writing. Um, and this was just like placing satire within the social networks themselves, um, kind of like unbounded by a publication. So rather than, you know, it's saying the New Yorker, it just kind of like exists on the web or within Facebook or within Instagram. Um, and it actually uh, makes it easier for the stuff to go viral and it, and it tends to escape or, or pop the filter bubble. Um, so I'm gonna go over a few projects I've done and, uh, oh, but first uh, some influences. Uh, in addition to like the traditions of like uh, tactical media and culture jamming and all the Yes Men and all of that. Uh, Zardulu, um, I don't know if anyone's heard of Zardulu, but um, she's a performance artist in New York. Um, she creates uh, hoaxes in real life and designs them in such a way that they go viral online. It's pretty cool. Um, she did Selfie Rat, uh, she created a three-eyed fish which she promised to send to me, but never did. I, I need to email her. Um, and she's rumored to have created Pizza Rat, if it's unconfirmed. Also, Nathan Fielder, um, this is just one of the things he's done, but his TV show is wonderful. I don't know if anyone's seen that, but um, it's a lot of media experiments, pranks, that kind of thing. And I, I believe he's, he's bringing like, very challenging work to a very broad audience, which is pretty cool. And uh, David Horvitz, who um, 
basically drove down the California coast and photobombed a bunch of photos of himself and then uploaded them to Wikipedia for all of the beaches along the coast and then recorded the reactions of Wikipedia editors as they tried to figure out like what the hell it meant. <laughs> this is very like, I mean, it, it, just seeing two side by side isn't, doesn't quite sell it. Like when you see all of them, it's very upsetting. Um, I could go on and on with influences. I'm kind of like uh, in this stuff all day and I love it. Um, that said, I have another sponsored post. I'm sorry, just, just 15 seconds. <laughs> Facebook, our board member is kind of a Nazi, but hey, we're still cool, right? <clears throat> I mean, right, fire him. Um, so uh, this is one of the early experiments I did and um, it was referencing that Alice in Chains music video, Angry Chair, uh, did, does anyone know that song? Yeah, there's like three grunge fans for. <laughs> it's a 90s song uh, and he's really mad and he sits in a chair and he's really, really angry in it. And um, I don't know, it's, I thought it was supposed to be a metaphor, but like in the music video is sitting in a chair. So I, he could just be writing about a literal chair. Um, anyway, I posted a listing on Craigslist and pretended to be a PA from the music video selling the angry chair. <laughs> and uh, I told people I would sell it to them if they gave me money and then a story about uh, why they're angry enough for the chair. And, um, so the thing is, like, if you create something like this and you frame it in such a way where it's an interesting enough story, it will get coverage. Like, um, I've been a blogger before. You have a post quota. You just need to write stuff all day. Um, so if you put something on the web that's like kind of engineered to be a weird story that hits a lot of pressure points, it'll get coverage. Um, not a single site fact checks this. Like. <laughs> And like, I did not make it hard. Like the name was fake, the email was fake. Um, you could have just reverse image searched the picture of a chair, which was like this shitty antique chair I found on uh, Google image search. Like it wasn't hard, no one did it. So uh, yeah, how did Trump rise to power? Um, I also got tons of emails and so this was kind of like, uh, a, a learning uh, experience for me. So uh, I don't think anyone can read these, but th they were incredibly like uh, sad emails. Like people were really excited to own this piece of like rock and roll history, even though it didn't exist. And um, it sort of like pushed me to maybe make stuff that punched up more than just like random sad people uh, who just liked a grunge band. Um, but that said, um, so I started maybe attacking upwards more and um, this is after uh, a cop murdered Walter Scott and um, right after that there's the typical like crowdfunding uh, drives to raise money for the family of the victim. Uh, this is a story we just see playing out over and over and almost every time like some group of asshole trolls will create a crowdfunding campaign to raise money for the cop. It's like this kind of like fuck you uh, to human decency. Um, like raising money for a murder cop, I mean, Jesus. Um, so the, the, I, it's my opinion that the sites that host these uh, uh, campaigns are just as, uh, they, they're, they're Im implicated in, 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 uh, in this, they make money from it. Um, so Indiegogo is like claiming this false neutrality, um, the hiding behind like this really naive notion of uh, free speech, when um, you know like the, the neutral stance, in my opinion, um, you're, you're just allowing this sort of like racist narrative to continue while making money from it. Uh, so I went on Google Maps. I was like super mad, as we are on our computers sometimes, and um, I just went on Google Maps and looked up their headquarters. And across the street, there was a billboard. I was like, okay. So I started a crowdfunding campaign on Indiegogo to raise money to rent the billboard across from their office. 
to say that they support racist cops. So if I raised enough money on their site, I'd have them paying for a billboard that mocked their company. <laughs> it was kind of cool. Um, and started making money and went viral a little bit. And then um, like two days later, or maybe less than two days, I just got the most awkward phone call from someone who worked there telling me that they were shutting down the campaigns for the cops, which is pretty cool. They, they had to like take a stance of, you know, ethical corporate responsibility or something. But they, they just quietly did it, which was also annoying. Like they could have had this moan of like, hey, we're a good company, like uh, look, look what we're doing. But they just like quietly killed it on a, on a Friday uh, afternoon, uh, West Coast time. So like the story just kind of like got buried, but it happened. Um, that said, it, this wasn't the only reason they shut it down. A lot of people were protesting, so I think this was like a part of a collection of, uh, you know, a lot of different people protesting. But I think it helped. Oh and, oh, and the money I made, I just donated to the family instead of the billboard after they took it down. Because um, yeah, the families have to like pay thousands of dollars for funeral costs. It's it's awful. Um, sorry, that's uh, really bleak for the morning. Um, changing gears to something more fun. Uh, I created a public Facebook account. Um, I gave the password out online. It was password1234. And uh, it was like public Facebook was the username, I think. I just gave it out to the internet. And um, I, I wanted to explore the individualistic assumptions of social media. So uh, yeah, thousands of people just started logging into this account and messing with it. And um, it was like a really fun week. <laughs> um, if anyone changed the password, I just got an email and reset it back to the standard one. And that happened like twice, which is pretty great considering the number of people who logged in. Um, n no one did anything fucked up either, which was interesting at least on the Facebook one. I set up two others. I set up a Tumblr and a Twitter, and almost instantly, they just turned into platforms for abuse. So uh, I don't know, maybe that reflects like the nature of the social networks themselves. I'm not exactly a fan of Facebook, but um, you know, maybe uh, it's better at dealing with abuse. Maybe better people logged in, I'm not sure. Um, people, someone just logged in and liked every pet crematorium in the United <laughs> States. And there's a lot of them. There's just pets burning all the time. Um, someone, uh, someone changed the uh, profile photo to be the Taco Bell logo and started answering customer service complaints on Taco Bell's site. Like, um, oh, it was so awesome. Uh, eventually, I wrote about it and. Um, it wasn't like anything within their system that registered that thousands of people were sharing the same account somehow. Uh, it was reading the article about it that engineers ended up shutting it down. At least that's what my friend at Facebook said. Um, and they couldn't figure out why it didn't like trip any alarms. <laughs> so I just, I don't think they really planned for this kind of thing. Um, but it was really fun. Oh, and people were like messaging within the like, uh, act the, the account, so like it was the account talking with itself, and like it, it was really cool. <laughs> and it's all gone now. I just have like screen grabs. Um, uh, also, I made a chat room for horses. Um, uh, I'll just let that sink in. Um, I, I said, I, me and a friend made this. We, we said that, uh, my friend Ryan Walker, he's a programmer, um, we said that we found a bunch of floppy disks in, in a burned out lot in Silicon Valley. And this was supposed to be the future of horse social networks, but they, they just, they, they were chasing better and better versions and couldn't get the public release together and then their building burned down. Those are the disks. Um, so it worked, like thousands of people logged in <laughs> and um, they, th pretty much all of them pretended to be horses for a day. Um, 
and you'll see on the side there, there's a, like, a little horse button, and if you clicked it, it would like add in horse sayings, like uh, nay or pfff, or um, <laughs> sometimes it would say like works on manifesto, which is a little ominous. Um, is, it, is it going? Yeah. Um, we also didn't um, have any spam control. <laughs> Uh, which was a bad idea, it turns out. Um, almost immediately, it just got bombarded with bots. And uh, we, we like lived the history of the internet in like a day. <laughs> like we were like, oh, we need, uh, right, uh, spam protection. And that, like we went through every stage of, and then it became like very sanitized by the end of it and not fun. Um, still more interesting than a Facebook feed though. Um, and just, the, this is the last project I, I'll go over. Uh, I, I created this phone tree. It's a choose your own adventure game. And uh, the goal is to reach a real person, which is me. It just forwards to my cell phone. And uh, it, it's like hours and hours of dead ends and different shell corporations um, of all different kinds of names. And I, I set up social media accounts for most of the companies. There's voicemail sections. Um, and I would post the voicemails online on a different Twitter account, and it was, uh, in, it was an incredible amount of work. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's kind of the general outline. I didn't think to use a program to do it. I did it on graph paper, which was a really bad idea. Um, and only seven people reached the end. So I had like one or two awkward phone calls, hardly. <laughs> They were like, who's this? I was like, I'm, I'm the operator. What, what do you want? They were like, what, what do you mean? I was like, you won. <laughs> I'm like, oh, all right, uh, what, do you, what do you want to do? And I'm like, I don't know, how's your day going? <laughs> it was really great. It's just some guy, in, some guy in Florida just did not expect to talk to a person. <laughs> just spent hours. <laughs> um, Okay, so what the hell does all of this mean? Um, I don't know. <laughs> These are really unscientific experiments with varying success rates uh, and maturity levels. And I feel somewhat un five minutes. Okay, I feel somewhat uncomfortable making any grand conclusions. That said, a um, few of the things I've learned: uh, a lot of these sites, the algorithms that govern them. They don't understand irony or sarcasm or humor. It's impossible to program, it would seem. I mean, maybe someone will figure it out. I doubt it. Um, it's complex. Um, this makes humor an incredibly effective tool for messing with these platforms. Um, humor attacks the edge cases that engineers just have a lot of trouble planning for. And this is great if you want to make satire um, or you know, a public Facebook account. Um, also, generally, I think people are exhausted by what their feeds present them all day. Um, just talk to anyone, ask them if they like what they see when they're scrolling, and they'll probably just sigh, because it's not very fun. Uh, so just by putting something online that's like a little weird and interesting and funny and challenging, just something new, people get excited about it, and they share it, and it, it becomes rather meaningful, um, to, as far as I can tell. And also, perhaps because of this novelty, they're willing to play along. Um, I think this is how you make it possible for thousands of people to pretend to be a horse for a day, or to peacefully coexist on a public Facebook account. Um, but again, it's the internet. Who knows? There's a counter rule for every rule. Um, uh, that said, I, I have one more sponsored slide if that's all right, just 15 seconds, um, then we can skip it. Mountain Dew, it'll help your kid deal with the divorce. <laughs> um, thank you very much, everyone. Um,